we'll go ahead and get started. And just to, briefly, I put a few things in the uh, chat, um, which are additional resources, and also a survey that I would really like you to click on and fill out at the end of this seminar. It'd be very helpful if you could do that. Um, and the reason I separated, I, I gave a presentation, a similar one, primarily for, for tropical fruit growers in Miami-Dade County, and then made this presentation. And the reason they're different is because of differences in environment, but also in access to the tools to protect your trees from freezing temperatures. The, the access to water, especially, or vo high volumes of water, um, is nearly unlimited here in Miami-Dade County, whereas outside of Miami-Dade County, that is not the case. And so you have to use some different strategies than you could use in Miami-Dade County. So we'll go ahead and get started with this. And so what is the, the freeze potential? And, and if, if uh, folks had looked at the um, publications that I sent along with the invitation, um, this is from that, taken from that uh, type of data, and talks about the freeze potential uh, in 2021, 2022. And actually, we're entering a La Nina uh, period, and it should go on through the spring, actually. Um, and part of that has to do with this graph on this uh, figure on the left showing the U.S., and showing that we have a 50 to 60% chance where the mean temperatures will be above normal. And what do we mean by normal? Well, that they're comparing to the last 20 or 30 year normal winter temperatures. And so we actually have a 50 to 60% chance we're gonna be warmer than those normal, that, that 30 year period. However, it doesn't mean that a freeze event cannot or will not occur, but it just means uh, we're probably going to be warmer, at least for uh, on the whole, for this winter. Also, we will have below normal precipitation. So um, we're looking at somewhere between a, a, a 40 to 50 percent chance of, of below normal precipitation. So we're probably going to have a dry winter uh, this this year, which is pretty typical. Um, the the dry, the low below, uh, the the low precipitation, although it's saying we might be a little bit drier. So this bodes well that, you know, we may be warmer this winter, but uh, doesn't mean we won't freeze. In this next graphic, um, you'll see the typical weather pattern. And this is showing the jet stream, the polar jet stream. And you can see that when we're in a La Nina, the jet stream is generally to our north. And this helps to keep the cold weather from reaching Florida. Uh, so that's a good thing. Um, if this was a, an El Nino or a neutral, that, that jet stream could be dipping down lower, which may allow freezing temperatures to reach us. Now, it's not to say the jet stream is going to be like this uh, every day this winter, but that's the general period, general uh, gist of what it would be like. And then this is a summary uh, from NOAA um, on on South Florida's dry season outlook. So temperatures supposedly uh, above normal, one to three degrees. Um, below normal precipitation, below normal uh, severe weather, freeze near normal, which means one to two events per season are potentially possible. Uh, drought and fire actually is above normal, and this is because of the, the potential for drought, dry conditions. And so if you read this data coming from NOAA, you will notice that they put in caveats that it is still possible to have uh, a freeze event occur. Um, not that I'm hoping for that or doom and gloom about it. I just think people need to be prepared. It behooves you to be prepared uh, for the trees and also from an economic standpoint. This is just showing an old time graph of the number of times it's been at or below 32 degrees over this 30 year period in the past. And you and it might surprise you to see, you know, um, here you are Davie, which is in, in, in Broward County, um, which is in Broward County, um, has, you know, had, had 60 events during that 30 year period. Homestead, 
uh, had 40 events. So it is potentially possible to have, and, and historically we have had freezing events uh, in South Florida. And you see West Boynton Beach, Del Rey, that's up in Palm Beach County. Again, freezing events, this is over out of a 30 years, they had nearly 20 events. So one thing you, we've also learned over time, and this has been documented through personal observations uh, and looking at data, um, probably, well, actually since the late 1800s, and this has been published, uh, most of it in the proceedings of the Florida State Horticultural Society, where people have gone out after freezing events, documented freezing events, and observed the reaction of trees, tropical fruit trees, to the freezing temperatures. And this has provided a gauge, a rough gauge on the freeze or freeze tolerance of these tropical fruits when they're not being protected from the cold by the use of water or structures or, or uh, tree wraps, things like that. So these are unprotected trees. And this is when you can expect damage or death of these trees. And you can see there's quite a range. Um, you know, Atamoyas, you know, once you get below 32, um, all bets are off. Um, of course, as you guys know, with a freezing event, it's not only how cold it gets, you know, the colder, the, the worse it is, but how long it is cold. And also how many times does it get cold? Is it just one event, one evening for a couple of hours, or is it one event? Uh, for, for 12 hours. So those all play into it. So these are um, the observations and, and, and the rough temperatures uh, that we uh, have documented, people have documented uh, where damage or death can occur to these tropical fruits. And you can see there's quite a range, key limes 32, Anamoya 32. However, some of the uh, Avocado varieties can go down into the 20s, right? And as you know, Florida grows mostly West Indian types or uh, Guatemalan West Indian hybrids. So it's somewhere in between there. And I also have in here, Carambola, mature trees, 26 to 28, young trees, 27 to 32. And, you know, all things being equal, you can see that younger trees are more susceptible to freezing temperatures at higher freezing temperatures than mature trees. And that's because of their less, they have less of a mass. So they're more exposed to the environment than a big tree with a mature canopy, which helps to hold in some of the heat from emanating from the ground during cold weather. Here's more tropical fruits, limes, longans. You can see loquats are quite cold tolerant. Uh, lychees, mame, mango, papaya, passion fruit. Um, and some additional ones. Um, you can see the sugar apples, you know, once you get down 28, 29, um, white sapotes. So there's a range, but um, these are unprotected trees. So what are the, the factors affecting the susceptibility and the recovery of uh, tropical fruit crops to cold damage? Part of it is their genetic predisposition. As you saw in the previous slides, different fruit crops have different tolerances to freezing temperatures. So some of it is just the inherent genetics. Another has to do with the site selection. So where are you located? What is your elevation? And I know that sounds funny in Florida, but there are differences in elevation, even though they're slight, and even a six inch difference can make uh, a difference in having cold pockets in a grove. Uh, they get exceptionally cold, uh, and there may be only a, an elevation difference of six inches. Um, also the slope, you know, which way is, is the land sloping? Um, are you, is the grove near a lake or on the edge of a lake on the south side or the east side, or is it the north side? The ocean, how close are you to the coast? All of those play into um, the potential for freeze damage and, and how freeze damage might play out. So the closer you are to the south side, if you're on the south, southeast or southwest of a lake, especially the southeast and south, uh, the potential less damage than if you were on the north side. Ocean, closer you are to the ocean, the better. Also plant vigor and health. So are the trees healthy and are they vigorous trees? 
So all things being equal, healthy trees are going to withstand cold or freezing temperatures much better than trees that are nutrient deficient or previously stressed by flooding or drought, right? Plant growth stage. So are the trees actively growing? Trees that are actively growing, putting out a new flush, new leaves, or even flowering are going to be more susceptible. That tissue is more susceptible to cold and freezing temperatures than trees that are dormant, or in our case, quiescent, which just means the reason they're not growing is because it's too cool. But uh, so basically, if your trees are dormant, they're, they're more cold tolerant than if not. Age and size. So this goes along, as I mentioned previously, larger trees tend to have more tolerance to freezing temperatures than small trees. And as I mentioned, because of the canopy size and characteristics. And then also predisposing environmental stresses. So were these trees previously stressed by flooding or by drought this summer? If they were, then they are less healthy and more likely to sustain substantial damage than if they had not been previously stressed. If you look at cultural practices, uh, high were the tree, you know, fertilizer rates. If the trees were fertilized with a high nitrogen rate going into the winter, that may stimulate them to grow, which makes them right growing and that new tissue is more susceptible to freezing than trees that are dormant. So that's why we generally don't recommend nitrogen fertilizers going into the fall and the winter. Pruning. Um, pruning is another thing too. So we generally don't recommend pruning your trees during fall and winter. Part of that has to do with the cycle of flowering and fruiting, but part of it has to do with if you're pruning, you're stimulating new growth. And you're also opening up the canopy to the sky, which then, which then um, allows more of the heat coming out of the ground to just dissipate up into the sky, which isn't good. Um, also irrigation. So are people, you know, irrigating their trees sufficiently that they don't have drought stress? Used to be uh, years ago, 40 years ago or plus, um, people felt that if you drought stressed your trees during the winter, they were more cold hardy. Well, it turned out that that really, what was going on is that if you are irrigating too much during the cool period of the year, which you should be reducing your irrigation rates or and frequency just because the trees are less active, right? Um, so they don't need to be irrigated as much because remember, if it's too cool, these tropical trees aren't absorbing water and nutrients during the winter. So there's no real reason to uh, irrigate them as much as you do during the spring and the summer when you've got flowering and fruiting going on. So the other thing I mentioned was depth and duration of cold temperatures. Uh, and so, you know, how cold does it get? Does it get to 24, 26, 28? How long, as I mentioned, for a few hours? Or is it, you know, eight hours? Or is it three times or just one time? So the number of freezing events can also be important. So if you're getting multiple freeze events, that's, that's more of a problem than if you only have one freeze event. So some of the other factors, uh, as, and, and this is just reiterating those factors, but just a comment just briefly. So genetic predisposition, papayas are more susceptible than avocados. Um, site selection. So establishing a new grove, you wanna take into consideration everything I've talked about with respect to your elevation and where you are in relation to lakes and oceans. Uh, plant vigor, as I meant, and health. So healthy trees can withstand it and recover better. Uh, Non-growing trees withstand more cold. Older and larger trees tolerate more cold. Um, trees that were recently flood stressed prior to a freeze usually end up with more damage as a result of exposure to freezing temperatures. Uh, the high fertilizer rates, as I said, if your trees are actively growing, um, then they're more susceptible. Timing of the printing, uh, of the pruning, more of a problem if you're pruning during the fall and the winter, right? Irrigation, it's complicated, um, but as I said, in general, you reduce your irrigation during the winter because the trees are not as active in taking up water and nutrients, therefore they don't need to be irrigated as often. Um, short deep freeze versus a long moderate freeze. So that duration can be important. Um, you know, if you have, uh, 12 hours at, at 30 degrees could be just as bad as three hours at 28, right? 
um, and then the number, number of freezing events. So monitoring the weather, and I think many of you are already familiar with these websites, but NOAA has uh, weather websites. The Florida Agricultural Weather Network, or FAWN, has a whole lot of, of real-time weather data uh, in Florida. And if you go up and type in FAWN, you'll reach that website. There is a lot of information up there on climate and on weather and tools there having to do with cold protection. Um, some of the other methods, of course, is listening to the radio, your telephones, our smartphones, TV, the internet, and then private services. Some people uh, hire private, private weather services to, to um, get specific predictions for their area. <clears throat> At the Grove level, it's a good idea to have, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a good idea to have thermometers in shelters. And you can easily build a small shelter. I'll show some pictures um, and put in there a, a, a temperature gauge that's a little bit sheltered so it's not being exposed to the sky um, and monitor temperatures. And I would suggest monitoring the temperatures at six feet and at two feet. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, also, there's auto automated weather station equipment. You can buy little weather stations or temperature monitors and things like that. You wanna be sure they're calibrated each year before uh, we get into the winter so that the temperatures are reading true, that when it says 32, it's actually 32 and not 28, things like that. And then also the visual and sensorial observation. And that means you need to go out in your grove, you need to be out in your grove during the freezing event to see the weather, see the sky, feel the temperatures, feel the breeze, detect which direction the wind is coming from, things like that. That's all going to help you in uh, determining what to do, if anything, during a freeze event. So is freezing weather on the way? So how do we tell that? So you basically want to be on alert from November through March, if you look at the histor historical data. We recommend you be prepared for freezing temperatures by mid-November. You really want to watch that jet stream pattern and the moving of cold air from the northwest to the southeast. If, if you hear the weather person talking about there's a Siberian Express or an Alaskan cold stream, cold weather express coming down uh, to the main, you know, to the 48 lower 48 states, you need to be paying attention to that. So you want to watch where that jet stream is. You also want to be aware, is there a low pressure system? And, and when you see these weather maps, you'll see highs and lows, the H and the L on the maps. Pay attention to their location. Is there a low pressure system over the southeastern US, around the Carolinas and West Virginia? If there is, that, that's setting us up to perhaps get a cold air blast from the north northwest. You want to watch for large Arctic high pressure systems, large cold air masses, as I, as I mentioned. You, you will hear about that from the weather reports. You want to look at the snow cover over the Midwest and the central US because when cold air moves from the northwest to the southeast, if the ground is not covered in snow, even though it's cold out, it, it won't, it, it will perhaps warm itself a little bit just. Be because it's going over land that's emanating uh, warm uh, temperatures up into the sky. Whereas if it's covered in snow, that, that air mass, that cold air mass is not gonna get any warmer. In fact, it's, it's gonna get worse. So you wanna pay attention if they're talking about record snowfall in the central US. Um, is there a high pressure center just west of Minnesota? And I know that sounds funny, but historically when there's been a high pressure system near Minnesota, uh, and North Dakota, um, that's sort of setting up the jet stream and, and the cold air mass for funneling down to Florida. And same thing could be said, is there a high pressure center west of Tallahassee? And that sort of gives you a hint that there could be some cold weather that could potentially funnel down to South Florida or Florida. So this is just showing you a map of the US and I've, I've painted in there a uh, jet stream 
And this is one that would, is not the La Nina jet stream, but another one. And you can see it's dipped down. And what's happened is it, it has allowed that cold air mass to go over the snow over the central US near Minnesota. And we have a low off in the Southeast and it has allowed that cold weather, that cold air to move into, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> into Florida and South Florida. So that's a problem. Okay, so some other things about uh, is freezing weather on the way, some other rules of thumb and what to watch for. Um, in advance of a predicted cold weather, we experience one or more days when the temperature doesn't exceed 65. So if we get into, you know, during this, this winter, if there's a couple of days where the temperature never gets to 65, that's sort of setting us up uh, for potentially more cold weather. Right, because if we get warm enough during the day, that sort of reheats the soil, reheats the environment here. But if it's not getting uh, uh, to 65 or above, we have less of a heat bank, you could call it, right? Also days when the temperature is at or below 60 degrees at by 3 p.m. or earlier in the afternoon. If we're getting reaching 60 degrees at by 3 p.m. again, it means we're not, we don't have much heat out there in the environment and we could get cold. Another one is if we experience two or more days or nights of cold but non-freezing weather, but especially if they're accompanied by wind. And this is pretty typical. And what's happening during those days is the heat that's in the environment, in the ground, in the buildings, in, in the in total environment, is being blown away, is being reduced. And that's sort of setting us up for an eventual, you know, the next day, a freeze event, right? As I already mentioned, the snow cover over the, the Northwest, the Midwest and the Middle US, that's also a sign that something's gone on. Also, if the forecast calls for a low nighttime dew point temperature below 30 degrees or less, so I, many of you know that uh, as the temperature falls during the night, if it hits the dew point temperature, that's when moist, it hits the dew point temperature and then the moisture that's in the air comes out of the air, right? You get dew. And what happens is that warms the environment. And so the dew point in some cases, in many cases, sort of gives you a feel for what is the lowest temperature I can reach tonight? So if the dew point temperature is 30 degrees at, for a predicted night and the temperature drops and we hit 30, all of a sudden that moisture comes out of, out of the air and we sort of stop at 30 degrees, right? And it might even warm up a little bit, right? But if that dew point uh, can change, so it could, we could hit the 30 degree dew point and things warm up a little bit and you say, oh, wow, everything's good. The problem is if there's more dry, cold air coming in behind that, it can drop the dew point again. So it could drop it to 25 degrees, let's say. So then the potential would change. We could potentially go to 25 degrees before it stopped dropping. So you have to pay attention. The dew point's an important uh, temperature to watch, especially during the winter. Um, cold high pressure systems, which move out of Canada to the south. And uh, as I mentioned, these, these cold uh, high pressure systems can cross the US Canadian border or anywhere from Montana to Wisconsin. You wanna be watching that. They usually take about two to four days. So you, so you might have two to four days to sort of get ready and get your, your mind around that we're potentially going to freeze. And the other thing is, is we normally experience two nights of freezing weather. That's pretty typical. And the first night, it's usually an advective freeze. And I'll talk more about that. And the second night is usually a radiation freeze. However, sometimes we get both types of freeze event in one night, in the same night. So that's, that's a possibility as well. So you wanna be aware of the differences because that will also inform what you can or should not do during a freeze event. So again, other rules of thumb, record low temperatures reported in the Midwestern states. Winds at the surface are blowing from the north to the northwest to the south, right? Florida is predicted to be a target of a high cold pressure system. Um, and actually there's some tools, there's a, a fair estimation of the lowest temperature you're gonna reach for a given night. 
can be gotten by a real rough calculation is subtracting 20 degrees off the air temperature taken at sunset. Right. Um, and also I mentioned the predicted nighttime dew point low is a fair estimate of the low temperature you could reach. But again, as I said, if more dry air comes in, that dew point could drop, okay? Um, and you can also record the dew point and the air temperature at sunset um, and, and using the minimum temperature overnight uh, temperature tool on Fawn. Fawn has a tool where you can put in the, the, the temperature at um, sunset um, and the dew point, and it'll give you a calculation of what the potential cold temperature might be. It's not exact, it's, it's, but it gives you a feel for, oh yeah, it's saying we could reach 28 degrees or 30 degrees. So types of freezes, advective freezes. These are freezes where there's a large cold air mass, which brings freezing and sub-freezing temperatures to Florida. These are characterized by windy conditions. So it's a windy freeze. So you got a lot of wind and it's really cold and, it, and it's uh, freezing temperatures. There's no difference in the, the temperatures between layers of the air. So the air at the, bot, at the ground level and 30 or 40 feet up is the same. It's just freezing temperatures. And what's happening is the heat from all exposed objects is constantly removed by these windy conditions. And this is a more difficult type of freeze to protect free trees from. So you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to this uh, because uh, in general, if it's too windy, we would not recommend you turn on uh, an irrigation system to try to protect the trees. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is a more difficult type of freeze to protect from. In con and, and this is what it looks like. So heat from all the objects is blown away plants, buildings, the soil and the ground. So you have this windy, windy air mass coming in, okay? And all the heat's leaving. Another type of freeze is called a radiation freeze. And this happens when there's little or no cloud cover. I'm sure you've all experienced. There's no wind, a little bit or very little wind. The sky is clear, it's beautiful out. But the heat from all the surfaces radiate and from the ground radiate to outer space. And there's nothing to block the escape of these heat waves from the Earth's surface. If there was cloud cover, those heat waves, those long wave heat waves, heat would hit those clouds and then bounce back to Earth and help keep some of the, the, the warmth in that's being radiated out. But if it's clear, it's just going right out into outer space. Typically with these types of freezes, there is a temperature inversion. Um, and what happens is that usually at 30 to 50 feet up from the ground, um, there may be a layer of, of air that's somewhat warmer than what we experience from, from 20 or 30 feet down. Now, if the difference between that lower temperature, I mean, yeah, if the difference between the low temperatures near the ground and this inversion layer, which is you know 30 to 50 feet up, is five degrees or more, if you mix these layers of air, you can actually raise the temperature at the surface uh, and, and improve uh, the temperatures along the ground, right? So here's just showing you. Um, here's, and, and there's clear sky and long wave radiation, everything's just radiating out, right? And this is what it, you might look like if we could see it this way. Um, here you have the cold air mass at the bottom. And here's this warm air mass. So it may be 24 here in, in this example, and it's 38 up above. If you can mix these two layers, you can raise the temperature. And the way to mix these air layers is, is historically has been by either a wind machine, which is not common in Florida. There, used, there, there is some out in the citrus industry in the citrus areas, or used to be, while well, there's still a few, um, and they're used, to, I've, I've seen a few in uh, Pine Island and some other places. They're not common. Um, you're looking at spending quite a bit of money to get one of these machines. Um, and yet, you, if the grove is large enough, you would need more than one machine, plus, uh, you know, the upkeep and taking care of it. And you might only use it once every 10 years. So more than likely, most people aren't going to buy one of these wind machines. 
We do have some grove owners who will contract with a helicopter company to come out and fly through that inversion layer and mix the, the wind. But that needs to all be agreed upon uh, ahead of time. Um, you're not going to call the helicopter hopter company on the afternoon of a predicted freeze and get them to come out and fly. Probably not. <clears throat> so let's talk about some methods of cold protection. I don't know why this did this, but uh, let me go back. No. Okay. There are passive methods, such as I've already mentioned, slight site selection, clean culture, pre-culled irrigation, soil banks, tree covers, and tree wraps. Active methods include fuel heaters, irrigation, mist systems, wind machines, ditch flooding, and a combination of these two systems. I'm gonna discuss those that I've highlighted in blue, okay? The other ones are, are really not uh, recommended or practical. Okay, I already mentioned the site selection, again, being near large bodies of, of water on the south or southeast side. Um, being near the coast. All those are beneficial for uh, where your grow is located. Clean culture. So clean culture, this is uh, the absence of vegetation or grass uh, and weeds on the grove floor. So this has to do with, uh, in some places where I've seen, you know, in, in north of Miami-Dade, where the groves, you can remove the vegetation and, and why. This allows the solar heat during the day to penetrate the soil surface and that heat to be stored for re-radiation at night. And so this is something that uh, you have, if you have sandy soil, things like that, you have the potential to do that. And this is because we know that mulch and grass in general prevents the penetration of this solar radiation into the soil. Um, and so by having this clean culture, you're, you're opening it up to uh, absorbing heat. Um, and when do you need to do this clean culture? You would need to do this weeks to months prior to a freezing event or cold weather. And I, and I can tell you cultivating or disking just prior, you know, a couple of days or a week prior to a cold event is not gonna be effective uh, because it loosens the soil uh, and the soil loses heat and doesn't allow for heat storage. So if you're gonna do this clean culture, it needs to, to be done, let's say, as you're entering the winter. So you're talking about you know, October uh, to the beginning of November is when you would want to remove that vegetation, right? This doesn't really work, as I mentioned, on the Rockland soils. Our, our soils really can't absorb a whole lot of heat, not as much as the sandier or loamy soils to our north. And this next one is called a pre-freeze irrigation. And so this is based on the fact that water has a high capacity to store heat. And so irrigating the grove several days prior to a freeze, a predicted freeze event, increases that capacity, that soil's capacity to store heat and then re-radiate it during a freezing event, right? So you're using the soil as a heat bank and the water that's in the soil as a heat bank because mo mo wet soil or moist soil can hold a lot more heat than dry soil. The other thing too is when you're gonna wet the soil, you wanna, the, the greater the land area in the grove you can get wet, the better, right? So, you know, if, if you just have micro sprinklers, you know, you might need to, uh, hopefully they'll have a pattern that, that overlaps as much as possible, like I said, because if you can get more of the grove wet and that soil heated up, the better, right? However, irrigating during the daytime prior to the night of a predicted freeze, I would not recommend, especially if it's already cold and or windy, because all you're doing then is evaporative cooling and you're actually pulling heat out of the environment. And you're not gonna have, you know, the, you're not gonna have any daylight hours to heat that water up in the soil or heat the soil. So this has gotta be done ahead of time. So if we see a freeze coming, let's say they predict a freeze in three, four, five days, 
you should immediately go ahead and do an irrigation. And I don't mean flood the place, but I do mean irrigate it thoroughly, right? One of the other options are uh, young tree, for young trees especially, are soil banks and tree wraps. Soil banks are effective for young trees, especially if you can protect the bud union and some of the, some of the trunk above the bud union and protect it from freeze damage. Even if the top of the tree is damaged or killed, as long as that cyan wood, a section of it is still alive and functional, that tree, <coughs> that tree, <coughs> excuse me, will regrow. <coughs> so that's a good, you know, so you, soil banks can be effective and it's effective for groves planted in sandy soils. You want to use clean soil. You want to mound it up two or three feet. You need to check it periodically for insects and diseases. And I know, you know, fire ants love that type of thing. So you'll probably have to remove it after the danger of freezing or frost is over, uh, which will be, you know, late winter, early spring, right? Another one is tree wraps. And the way tree wraps work is the only thing they really do is they delay, delay the time uh, they delay heat loss from the trunk area. And so <clears throat> if, if the exposed trunk without a, a, a wrap on it reaches freezing in, in three hours, uh, if you put a, a wrap on it, it might be five hours. And why is that important? Because you may buy yourself some time. So the temperature is dropping at night and let's say it drops to, uh, you know, 32 or below at four in the morning. Well, if you, if you don't have a, a wrap on it, it's going to be exposed to 32 for two hours. If you put a wrap on it, it won't be exposed to 32 at all because it, it's going to protect it for five hours. Do you see what I mean? And many times these tree wraps are used in conjunction with irrigation, with micro jets. And we'll talk more about that. Um, these wraps should be constructed of a material that has a high insulation value. And what I mean by that is that it has to be a, an insulator. Um, there are some tree wraps out on the market that basically look like egg cartons and they're constructed to the materials like an egg carton, they don't work. So it's gotta be something with a high insulation value. Um, and they should be inspected and possibly removed after the winter. This is just showing you. So there's a citrus tree with a soil bank. That's a typical soil bank. And so it'll protect that, that trunk, you know, several inches up into uh, and above where the graft union is. And here on the right is a citrus tree with a tree wrap. It's a foam type wrap that was put on there, plus um, a micro sprinkler that's been uh, angled uh, to sprinkle up onto that wrap and provide additional cold protection, which we'll talk about. Other types of, of ways to protect young trees are these individual or, uh, and, and row quonset type um, structures. Uh, they could provide some protection, especially in conjunction with irrigation underneath them. Um, they don't, you know, depending on what the material is made of, um, they don't always work real well, but they, they can work, especially if there's a micro sprinkler. They have been used on young uh, orange trees. They've not been tested on tropical fruits. Um, caution, you know, any tree surface touching that cover will be damaged by the freezing temperatures, which might not be, you know, it's not devastating, but they are expensive and time consuming to put together. Um, and if it's windy, they can be blown away. So they need some way to be held down, whether it's by soil or with pegs or, and wires or something. Orchard fuel heaters, um, they work by providing direct heat to plants. They're commonly called stack heaters. Generally 35 or more were required per acre. They've really gone out of favor because there's a lot of environmental issues with them because they use diesel fuel and there's issues with it, you know, spilling and uh, pollution and things like that. These are hard to come by. You may even need a permit to use them. So I just bring it up because I do know in some cases um, there are people that have used them and, and still use them, but there's a lot of you know, things to consider, right? 
Wind machines, I mentioned previously, uh, it's a permanent structure. You're looking at ten dollars to $15,000 or more for each one. They're only effective during those radiation freezes. Um, and so they're only effective for, you know, maybe up to 10 acres. So if you have more than 10 acres, you might need more than one. Again, the helicopters, you've got to arrange this in advance. They're only effective during the radiation freeze and they, they could be expensive to use. Again, showing you the radiation freeze and the idea of mixing those two layers. And you need to detect whether there is an inversion layer. So you, you want to know if there is one. So systems that use water. Um, flood irrigation and then different types of irrigation systems. And we'll go through this now. These mist or fog systems, um, they're, they use very small droplet sizes and they raise and maintain the air temperatures above freezing by reducing the radiation heat loss from the ground and some, and some sensible heat effect. But they have to be properly installed. They use very high pumping pressures. They have to use very clean water, elaborate filtering. Um, they have to be run properly. They're expensive. They have to be maintained. They're not effective if it's windy during the freeze. Um, they might be suitable for enclosed areas, like if you're growing something in protected culture. Uh, but out in the environment, they have not proven to be uh, reliable or safe to use, really. People have ended up with more damage rather than less damage. Flood irrigation. This is a possibility um, where either the entire grow of land or the land between the rows, more likely, where people are growing trees in the flat woods and they have uh, the infrastructure to place water quickly in, the, in between the rows of the trees and also have the ability to remove that water quickly from in between the rows. Um, and what you're doing by placing all that water there, that flooding in the, in the ditches, is you're putting in a huge heat source in the grove. Um, you do need to use, you know, this can only be used for flood tolerant trees. You've got to have the right contours and ditches and canals. You have to have that ability to pump water on and off quickly. Um, should be used on trees planted on beds that are sufficiently high to keep most of the root system above the flooding if possible. Um, they use usually diesel or gas engines to avoid electrical brownouts. Um, may be more effective in conjunction with micro sprinklers, may not be. But I have seen uh, a few long gang, I have seen a long gang grove that used um, flood irrigation in between the rows to protect their trees um, and have done it successfully. So what is the principle of cold protection above, uh, of these above ground irrigation systems? So I'm talking about sprinkler systems now, okay? So the way, the way water protects a, a tr tree from freezing to death is that the, the inherent or the sensible heat of this water coming out of the ground gives off a little bit of heat as it cools to 32. And I mean a very little bit of heat. But more importantly, the heat of solidification or the heat of fusion, and this is when water changes from a liquid to a solid, gives off a tremendous amount of heat, okay, additional heat. So the theory is, and the way this works is, if sufficient water is continually applied to a plant and, and the plant surfaces, all the plant surfaces, and the plant can withstand 31 or 32 degrees, so these are plants that can take 31 or 32 and not die, the heat is given off as that water hits the tree and changes from a liquid to a solid and maintains that plant at about 31, 32 degrees. So it's basically entombing the plant in ice, in, in freezing water that's constantly freezing. If for some reason you don't apply sufficient water or it gets turned off during the freezing event, you'll actually get evaporative cooling and it will get much colder than 32. So this is a so this is something um, you have to be very cognizant of. Once you start 
to use water, you can't stop until the freeze is over. But this is how it works. So there's three key components of cold protection using um, above ground irrigation systems, whether it's the micro sprinklers or the, the high volume systems. One is the, uh, the plant must be able to survive 31 or 32. As I mentioned, you have to supply sufficient water and it must be continuously applied to the plant surfaces throughout the period of freezing temperatures. And lastly, the water must completely cover the plant surfaces. Now, this isn't entirely true because some micro sprinklers, the goal is to protect the trunk area. Um, and some high volume under tree system, it's designed to protect the tree maybe up to seven feet or so. So you would lose the canopy above that, but you would save the lower canopy. So, okay. I'm not gonna talk a lot about these because these are not common above, uh, outside of Miami-Dade County anymore. Um, these are high volume over tree irrigation systems um, and they require you know, large pump pressure. They need to put out 0.2 inches or more of water per acre per year. Um, advantages is you do get complete land coverage. It works well for many trees, but disadvantages, you need big pumps, big engines, you need to maintain the irrigation heads, uh, winds can distort the pattern, and you can end up with loading the tree down with ice and, and breaking the tree down. There are high volume under tree systems, again, similar to what I just mentioned, but the sprinklers um, are only two or three feet high. Um, and they again, require some pretty good pumping pressures. Uh, and again, applying 0.2 inches of water per acre per uh, per hour or more, and generally apply water up to about eight feet. This is a high volume over tree system, is what I was talking about first at first, and you can see here's a rain bird ahead. And this is this is this system protecting a carambola grove. And uh, it did, you see the trees are covered in ice, those trees survived a significant freezing event. And here it is with sugar apples. And you can see the trees are entombed in ice. Here's one of the problems, ice loading, and it split this long gantry open. Here, Mame, the limbs got loaded with ice and it just knocked off a number of limbs, but the trees survived for the most part. So, um, let's see. Why is this going backwards? Okay, so these are the high volume uh, under tree systems, and I've already spoken to them uh, uh, again. Generally, the big advantage is you get less, less ice loading and less breakage from ice loading if you use this system. And this is what it looks like here. You can see that it's only about three feet high with the rain bird head in this case. Um, and then there's one called high volume in tree system where you apply either, a, you have either a spinner type system or a rain bird and you have one for each tree and they are anywhere from three to five feet from each tree. And so we call them in, can, in tree irrigation and they put out a lot of water. You need big pumping uh, capacity. Um, and these are not common, but they can really protect trees from freezing temperatures. They're, they're probably the best system, but it's also the most expensive system. Uh, and there's a picture of this lychee tree that's losing, lost some limbs, but you can see the spinner on the inside of that tree. So low volume, this is what I'm gonna talk about mostly. Um, which is more common outside of Miami-Dade County. So you're looking at characteristics typically of applying 10 to 30 gallons per sprinkler per hour or more. Um, it's recommended that you apply at least 2,000 gallons per acre per hour. You have the polyethylene tubing for the laterals along the soil surface, um, and then use hard plastic spray heads. They require less pumping pressure, so you're looking at about 30 PSI. Um, they're ground-based. They have been used successfully to protect citrus historically. Um, they also can be placed on 
little poles uh, in the canopy and they can successfully protect some citrus trees even up to about five years old. However, their effectiveness is really only during calm freezing events. Um, and so they can provide a little bit of protection for larger trees, but only uh, up into the canopy so many feet. So in general, we recommend placing these micro sprinklers on the northwest side of the tree. Why? Because during, the, during freezes, as I mentioned previously, the wind is basically coming out of the northwest. And so if, if the sprinkler happens to be on and it gets windy, um, it's going to blow that sprinkling, that water onto the tree. If you have it on the south side, it's going to blow it away from the tree, which is not what you want to do. Um, you generally want to use uh, a spray pattern that's more like a 90 degree spray pattern. Um, the spoke sprinklers aren't really recommended to do that. Um, and then the 360 is not as well, right? You want to concentrate the water um, onto the trunk. And so you would use a 90 or a 180 pattern. If you do put the sprinkler up into the tree and it has to be secured uh, in the tree or with a pole on a tree, you could use a 360 pattern, right? Because you're trying to spray the entire inside of the canopy. Advantages of these micro sprinkler systems uh, and uh, let me just mention, you know, the more water you can pump, the better, right? So if you have a choice between a 10 gallon per hour per sprinkler and a 30, go with the 30, right? Um, that's more water means more potential protection, right? Advantages of these micro sprinkler systems is less pumping uh, capacity than these high volume systems you're using a lower volume of water per acre. They may be easier to maintain and repair than these high volume systems. However, during windy weather, they can, their pattern of spray can get distorted. As I mentioned, they do apply less water, so there is somewhat of a less potential for cold protection. They have been used successfully on citrus. Uh, very little work has been done uh, or, or experience on tropical fruits. I will talk a little bit about that. Um, so, and, you know, limited experience with our tropical fruits. And if the system fails, you know, your, your trees can be damaged or killed. So you, you really want to <clears throat> use this, uh, and plan for it. So here's an entry system up on the left here on a sapodilla tree. And so it has a tree wrap and this is actually, um, insulation for a home that has been wrapped around that trunk. Uh, previously to the freeze. And then they put the sprinkler on a pole and tied it to the sprinkler and it's got a 360 spray pattern and it's spraying into the canopy. This is a lychee tree with a sprinkler that has a 90 degree spray pattern and it's spraying just up into this trunk area to protect this trunk. Here it is ground-based citrus and you can see this is after a freeze and it was spraying just up into the trunk. Now, fortunately, they didn't have, it doesn't look like they have much in the way of canopy damage, but if the canopy had been killed, at least the cyan is still alive here. And this is just a close up of a micro sprinkler at the base of a tree. So, how to prepare for a freeze? You know, install a cold protection system and maintain it, test your system. It's really important to test everything way before a freeze event. You're, you're, you're going to be hard pressed to get somebody to come out and fix your pump or engine um, a few days before a predicted freeze or the day of a freeze event. Um, you should periodically test the system uh, for several hours, uh, you know, a week during the cold season. You want to make sure if you're using diesel or gas, you've got a full tank. Um, here's the Grove temperature shelters I was talking about. They're just easily constructed out of wood. Um, this one's mobile and it's put, it on, put into a little concrete here. And here's the temperature gauge here. And you can read the temperatures. You can buy digital temperature uh, devices as well, either one. Um, use your cell phone or weather radio to listen to the weather. Um, and 
If you can, you can either purchase a digital one or the old time sling psychrometers to get what the dew point is in your grove. So, you know, the National Weather Service and Fawn, they give you the dew point at where their weather station is. Well, that dew point may be different at your grove or in different parts of your grove. So you need to pay attention to that. So, so there's some crops with special issues, pitaya. We don't really know very well the tolerance to chilling and freezing, te freezing temperatures for this species. And there, there may be differences between the species and the clones and the hybrids. Um, we do know they are sensitive to chilling injury. So when we get into periods of temperature where the temperatures are for, in the 40s or below, you can end up with what's called photo damage, which has to do with high light and cool temperatures causing damage to the surface of the vine. Uh, where you get sort of a bleached look to the epidermis, to the upper layer of the vine. Um, and it's also during that time that photo damage is, is inhibiting photosynthesis during that time. Um, we also, from the literature and what we can see, gather, is that there is potential damage at, at below 29 degrees for the vines and potentially death of the vines when you get down into 24, 26 degrees. Of course, depends on how long, right? So considerations for this crop, you know, um, high volume irrigation, overhead sprinkler systems might work well, although if you get a lot of ice loading, potentially you could break the vine up quite a bit, although you might save most of the vine. Um, under tree, under plant uh, irrigation system, you know, high volume irrigation system, you probably have less damage and you could save part of the vine that's on the trellis itself on the pole. We don't know the effectiveness of, of the micro sprinklers. Um, one thing that is of concern, of course, is you know these are cacti, so they don't like to be over irrigated and saturated all the time. So uh, one thing you might do is, is if you have a plastic barrier around the bottom of the plant to help prevent water from hitting the stems directly and having it just hit the ground, um, that might be might help. Uh, we're not sure. Also, insulation wraps. It might behoove people to try insulating the base of the pole two or three feet up so that you could at least save part of the vine, where if the rest of the vine was killed, you'd have something that would regrow relatively rapidly. And then also whether the pre-freeze uh, um, irrigation strategy is a good thing for, for uh, Pattaya, probably. Um, and also whether during cool weather, so if we start to get into cool weather, whether doing a uh, whitewash of the upper stems or any stems showing to the sky um, is beneficial in preventing this photo damage uh, and bleached epidermis. So here is showing some of that photo damage. So this happened during a chilling event which was lasted over several days actually. And you'll notice the brown on the stems and the yellowing on these stems. And what happened is that you have cool weather um, and high sunlight and the photosystem in the cacti and, and many plants uh, slows down during cold weather. And instead of the sunlight driving the photosynthetic reactions, it's so high that it causes damage to the photosynthetic system itself. And then it's manifested in this yellowing and dying of the epidermis, basically. And whether if we were getting into a significant cold period, let's say December, January, you know, uh, where it's in the 40s, not freezing, it's in the 50s or the 40s, whether it would behoove people to go out and whitewash, just spraying a whitewash, which is basically a 50-50 mixture of water and white latex paint, or you can make your own white, own whitewash using um, hydrated lime stone plus a little bit of zinc sulfate and spraying that out to put sort of like a, a, um, a sunscreen over uh, the exposed parts of the vine, whether that would prevent this photo inhibition. We're not sure. <clears throat> Passion fruit is another one. 
Um, it uh, is cold sensitive, and some of the varieties are a little bit more frost tolerant than others. Um, again, whether to have a, a high volume system over the vine, um, you can get some potentially some breakage or an underplant system where potentially you'd have less damage. Micro sprinklers, we don't know how effective they would be. Again, you could probably, uh, with tree wraps and the micro sprinklers, save the bottom of the vine, the structure, the, you know, the trunk area uh, that it could regrow from. Um, and again, using these high insulation wraps. And we have some experience with passion fruit. Uh, this was a system where we had a high volume over the vine system, and you can see the vine there entombed in ice, and the vine did come through the freeze relatively intact. Of course, you could get enough ice loading to break that vine up. We didn't in this case, this is in 2010, the last time we had a freeze event really here in Miami-Dade. Banana is another one. We know that uh, their growth slows below 68, basically stops uh, when you get into the 50s. Um, and showing injury can, again, like the, the dragon fruit, uh, can occur when you're in the 50s with bananas and you get this bleached epidermis and the plant doesn't flower or grow correctly. The fruit doesn't uh, mature properly. Um, they are sensitive to temperatures of 32 and below. So um, the success of protecting bananas has varied. Um, in many cases, the plants are killed to the ground, but they will regrow from that corm underground. So it would be a matter of cleaning up uh, the banana planting, uh, removing all those damaged or dead uh, pseudo stems. Um, we know that you need at least four healthy leaves to mature a young bunch of bananas. Um, a you know, perhaps a nearly mature bunch might uh, mature uh, <clears throat> after uh, the, the leaves die, but not usually very well. Um, a newly emerged or 50% developed bunch is not going to mature properly if it doesn't have enough leaves. Um, so after a freeze, you need to wait to see how many functional leaves you have um, before doing anything. This is to show you after a freeze and basically all these tops are dead. Um, and here's the fruit here. And even though it you know, survived the freeze, that fruit, you can see the discoloration is sort of water soaked, it, it never matured properly. Here's a grove where they used high volume overhead sprinkler irrigation to uh, encase the tree, the vine. And even though it protected them moderately, um, they did not perform well after the freezing event. Um, it's probably better just to uh, cut everything down and let it regrow from the base. Papayas is another one sensitive to temperatures below 68 and certainly damage at 54 in the 50s and anything freezing 31, 30 degrees. Uh, once you get below that, you're, you're basically, the trees are gonna die. Potentially you could use irrigation, although you would get some, if you get ice buildup, you're gonna have some leaf breakage. Uh, Underplant, you might be able to protect the, the, the plant up to you know, three, four feet at most. So you'd end up cutting off uh, the stem and letting it regrow some branches and, and trying to harvest off of that, which may work. Actually, we've, we've done that typically when plants get too tall. And here's showing you using cold protection. In this case, uh, we didn't have much ice loading. Um, and we protected these, these papayas fine. But you can see these papayas are probably only seven, eight feet high. Um, and it was not a, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a freeze event, but it was not um, a devastating 12 hours below freezing. And here is a plant from a freeze, a previous freeze event that was not protected. And basically this is the next morning. And it's already desiccating and, and starting to die. So how to prepare for a freeze? I spoke about this before. A, a freeze is predicted. 
You want to closely monitor the weather, both the prediction and what's occurring in your area. Remember the signs I talked about. Um, remember, you know, most of the weather reported, especially on TV news and, and a lot of the radio news is from urban areas and near airports or things like that. Um, and so these temperatures are always above what it would be in the agricultural areas. I suggest listening to more than one weather source. Um, I would also tune in and not tune into, but look at the fawn weather system. Um, there, there, there's probably 20 or more stations throughout the state, shows you real time weather data. Um, there's also maybe some local um, weather uh, stations that you can tune into or get on the internet. You want to be testing your system. And if you're going to do the pre-freeze irrigation, you want to do that uh, ahead of the freeze by uh, several days, you know, four or five days, if possible. So one of the things you want to watch out for, and this has happened, is that the temperatures sometimes after sundown can drop really rapidly, four to 10 degrees in one to two hours, and get into the 30s within an hour to several hours right after sunset. And this catches a lot of people by surprise. And the reason this occurs is that if we have been having days and that day uh, has relative, relatively low relative humidities, so the relative humidities in the 50s and the 40s, and the sky is clear, when, when we hit sunset, the temp, there's, 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 no, there's not much moisture in the air to hold any heat. And so the temperature begins to drop really, really rapidly. So uh, you need to watch out for that. So if we've been having low, you know, everybody says, oh man, the weather is great. There's very little humidity. Yeah, that's great. But concerning a freeze event, you need to watch for those temperatures to drop really rapidly. People have been caught off guard that thought, oh, I'm not gonna have to go out and protect my trees until midnight or one or two in the morning. By 10 o'clock, it's already freezing. So you need to really pay attention to the relative humidity as we go into this winter. So it's freeze time. So when do you start your micro irrigation system if you're going to use that? If you've had, if you're going to use soil banks, you need to make them days ahead, right? You're not going to be able to put in a thousand soil banks with one or two people in a day, right? The evening of, uh, that's not going to work. Same thing with tree wraps, it needs to be done ahead of time. Row covers, similar. So these are things you need to think about now prior to the potential freezing event. Same thing with the micro irrigation system, you need to make sure it's working, it's prepared, it's got everything ready. Um, you wanna monitor, this is why I said you wanna monitor temperatures, not just at six feet, which is typically what the National Weather Service and other services do, the fawn does measure temperatures at two feet, six feet, and 30 feet, which is helpful. But if you have some temperature thermometers in your grove, I would suggest having them at two and six feet. <clears throat> the thing about micro irrigation systems, remember that poly tube or that black tubing is along the ground, the surface. So potentially the water in that tubing could freeze. So you need to have that system prior to 32 degrees, probably running on idle, maybe squirting a little bit of water, not really, you know, just dribbling out. Why? <clears throat> because if that water freezes in the tubes, when you go to turn the system on, you're not going to get the micro sprinklers to work. So we would suggest, strongly suggest that you, you, you have that thing sort of idling, because remember, if you're reading temperatures at six feet, it might say, oh, it's only 30, you know, 35 degrees or 34 degrees. On the ground, it's already 32. So just, just remember, it's colder at the ground than it is even six feet above the ground, right? For the flood systems, remember, you need to put that water in between the rows. Uh, you need to know how long it takes to fill the ditches and plan for that so that those ditches are full uh, as this flooding event begins to unfold, right? So if it, you know, if it takes three days to fill the, <laughs> to, to fill the ditches, 
you need to start three days ahead of time. You, you see what I mean? So. Okay, so let's assume you have prepared, and I'm going to skip over this high volume irrigation because it's a little bit different on when you should turn it on, as I've been talking. Um, but again, wind is the big thing. If the wind speeds are low, you know you can you could uh, turn on the system. If these wind speeds are high, above 10 miles an hour, you may not want to turn on that system. And if we're having uh, let me just see, let me go back, sorry. <clears throat> so if, um, if we're having winds, you know, up, you know, five, 10 miles an hour above 10, you know, 10 or above, um, it's gonna distort, it could distort the wind, the water pattern of high volume and micro sprinkler irrigation. And it's probably better not to turn it on. The second comment is, so, for the first half of the evening, you may have a windy freeze, an advective freeze. So it's really windy and it's really cold and it's, it's at 32 or below. It's probably better don't turn the system on, especially the micro jet or micro sprinkler system. However, at two o'clock, all of a sudden the wind dies down, the clouds move off or there may not be any clouds and it's clear sky and everything's very still. Now you're going into a radiation freeze. Now is the time to turn on your, your irrigation system. So you have to, you, you really have to stay up and watch things because things can change during the night. <clears throat> so you want to be monitoring throughout the night, right? And you need to be there. So sitting at your computer where it's nice and warm is great. And you can get a lot of information, but your grove, you, you really need to be out and about and looking at things and making sure things are working are going to work. And just one last thing about that is, you know, many times we have multiple freezes. So they come in twos. And we, in other words, we have two nights of freezing temperatures. So you wanna be sure you have enough fuel, enough parts. Some other uh, weather sites to tune into. There's a lot of uh, agroclimate, excellent weather site. And they have tools in there also that have to do with cold protection. Um, the National Weather Service, um, they have this hourly weather graph, which is really, really helpful. Type in your zip code, you'll get the hourly, you'll, you'll get the, um, the prediction and then go down to the right hand corner at the bottom and you can click on this graph and you can make it a table and it shows you the hourly changes or predicted hourly changes in temperature, relative humidity, dew point, wind, wind direction, very, very helpful. Intellicast has some good information as, as, as does the weather on other ground. And here's the FAWN system. So if you type into your favorite search engine, UF, IFAS, FAWN, you will hit that website and look for a station that's near you, okay? Other, your, your county may have some real-time weather stations as well. A local airport may also. I, I'm, your 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 local airport may also have have um, weather information as, as as well. Okay, common freeze damage, plant symptoms. Common symptom: leaf wilting, water soaking, browning, dead leaves that persistently hang on the stems, leaf drop, flowers and fruit water soaking, browning, shriveling, and drop. Actually, you know, leaf drop on a tree might be a good sign after a freeze because this indicates that the stem tissue was still alive and could form an abscission zone between the leaf and the stem and drop off. If the leaves are still hanging on the tree, this means there's probably some stem damage. How much, you don't know, but there's probably some. Here's a picture of water soaking on avocados. This is the next day after a freeze on these, these caramola leaves, and they've already killed all the cells in these leaves. They're starting to dry out and desiccate. Here's that same tree, um, and you can see there's already stems and, and leaves hanging on. Um, it's been dropping fruit. You see the water soaking on this caramola fruit. So there's really nothing you can do with this fruit, right? 
This is a long gantry, and I showed this before, but it's been loaded with ice from a freeze and split it down the middle. And of course, here's the bananas. The underground part is still alive. The above part is, is history. So other com common freeze damage, twig, limb, and trunk discoloration. So if you peel back the bark a little bit, you'll see browning. Um, and death of the wood, eventually. Um, trunk, bark, and limbs, bark splitting, sap exuding from the bark, and of course, you know, death. So, okay. So what do you want to do after a freeze? And basically the major, major method is do not prune immediately after a freeze. I know everybody gets anxious to go out and do something and change this and make this right. I can tell you the best thing to do is nothing. Just go out and assess the situation. Why? You can't tell what is actually dead at this time. If you prune at this time, you may actually prune off live wood, which is not good. Or there may be another freeze event and actually even dead leaves can provide some barrier to the heat loss from the ground during this second freeze. So it's, it's not a good idea. Also, um, if you do prune, you may not prune off all the dead wood. So you'd have to go back later to remove more dead wood. And it may take anywhere from two to six months to actually know what's alive and what's dead, depending on the severity of the freeze. And when you do prune, you wanna prune back to live wood. Okay, so I know everybody wants to do something, it's better to wait. And when you do, you wanna prune only jagged limbs and trunks uh, to major crotches or stump if there's total damage on the upper part of the canopy, but try to save as much of the trunk as possible. If you wanna spray copper onto the entire tree at labeled rates one time after, it might help tamp down a little bit of the, the wood rotting fungi that, that in inevitably uh, come. So pre the, the post-freeze irrigation. So if you have a grove or trees with little leaf damage, they should be irrigated normally during dry periods. You know? But remember, if it's during the winter, uh, you don't irrigate that much anyway, but I'm just saying, right, normally. If you have moderate leaf damage, so you end up with a tree with less leaf area, let's say 50% of the, the leaf area, you wanna reduce either the rate of irrigation or the frequencies, right? Because you've lost part of the canopy. Remember, trees only lose water through their leaves. If they don't have leaves, they're not losing water. So if, if normally it took a gallon to feed an entire canopy with water and you only have half the canopy, use half a gallon. You, you see what I'm saying? And then trees with little or no leaves really should not be irrigated until there's signs of new growth. And that's because if you irrigate a tree and saturate the soil, you're reducing the oxygen content in the, in the soil. And remember, roots need oxygen to live. If you're drowning the roots, those roots are gonna die. And then the tree is not gonna recover well, or maybe even die back more. Fertilization. So again, if you have little damage, maybe a little bit of leaf and wood damage um, or no damage, just fertilize them normally. Of course, during the winter, as I mentioned, I would not be applying nitrogen to the trees. You don't want them to grow really during the winter. If you have moderate leaf loss, um, you could fertilize the trees, you know, as they're regrowing. And you might want to do this free, and, and I would suggest doing it frequently, but at a reduced rate, right? So you have less of a tree and you want sort of nutrients around or use a slow release material. That, that releases fertilizer slowly. So it, the tree has access to nutrients as it's recovering. If you have complete loss of, of the leaves, but the stems and things are intact um, and the tree starts to regrow, you might actually want to apply fertilizer at a slightly higher rate or more frequently as this new growth comes in to, to take care of it, right? Um, and then trees with severe uh, leaf loss or wood damage, you want to reduce the rate based on the percentage of the canopy lost. You know, if, if it's an early season freeze, it might be better just to wait until warm weather to fertilize because you don't want to stimulate more growth in midwinter, right? Um, 
You do want to control weeds. Um, I, this, I've not seen this happen, but if you look at the historical record, there have been cases where the weeds were killed in, in a grove and they caught fire and then you had fire in the grove, which is not a good thing either. So recommended be prepared by mid-November, monitor the weather and uh, good luck. And then let me stop sharing. And I think somebody had a question in the chat. So let me um, see if there was something. Um, let me see. Yeah, and so um, Jeff has reposted the um, has reposted the uh, seminar evaluation, and um, I'll open it up to questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to. You can unmute yourself, and uh, I'm glad to take your question. Like I said. Here is this evaluation form. I'm also recording this uh, presentation. So if you want to look at it later or you know somebody else that wants to, I will be posting it, uh, sending it out in an email. So are there any questions? Does anybody hear me? <laughs> We are here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I've been talking this whole time and nobody has heard a word I've said. Um, hey, Dr. Crane, it's Santiago with Tree Amigos um, Growers up in Broward. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hey, um, I just had a question. Um, I, I heard a lot about the tree information and uh, I'm assuming these all apply to vegetable crops to, to the same uh, extent? No. Vegetable crops, it's it's okay. So we do, there are growers who protect or try to protect some of their vegetable crops and they will do this with water. Um, I've, not seen them, I've not seen anybody doing it with micro sprinklers. Um, I have seen them doing it with high volume sprinklers, uh, you know, that are two or three feet high, high volume, like rainbird sprinklers. Um, and again, yeah, they would start turning that water on when they get to 34, 35 degrees, um, like you would with the, the trees, but I'm not seeing them do it with, with micro sprinklers. I have also, uh, where people will put covers over their vegetable crops, um, and, and with or without, a, you know, an irrigation system underneath drip irrigation, I can tell you will not do anything for you. Drip. Okay. Drip absolutely provides no protection whatsoever, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I have seen high volume people down here do use high volume on some of their most valuable vegetable crops um, in the hopes of, of you know, saving those. And, uh, and that has worked historically, but it's with a high, like they're putting out, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 inches of water per acre per hour. Wow. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, what I heard you say was that um, um, I'm a little, I was a little confused because you said that you shouldn't turn them on the night before, I guess, unless there's an inversion and oh. there's things change quickly. Yeah, so what I was saying is that I'm talking about the pre-freeze irrigation, I think you're right. talking about. Yeah, so if you have, you know, if you have a way to irrigate the land, uh, as much of the land as possible, prior to a freeze event. So this is supposed to be done anywhere, you know, three, four, five days ahead of a predicted freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, and this way, you know, you've gotten the ground wet, you've saturated, like if, if I knew, if, if they were predicting, you know, we're gonna have a freeze, potentially have a freeze in, in four days, I would go out and I'd irrigate everything well, really well. And then I would just leave it like that um, and then the sun's rays over those next two or three days would help to warm up that water in the soil and then right. it get freezing, it would re-radiate. However, applying that water the day before or the, the afternoon or the morning before of the predicted freeze, uh, especially if it's windy, is not really going to do anything because there's not enough, down, uh, yeah. Yeah, enough time for the sunlight to warm it up. Do you see, do you see what I mean? Yeah, yep. 
And then when would you recommend doing it the day off of the night before? Because just if you haven't done the free free, the, the pre freeze. Well, if you haven't done the pre freeze, um, if you have a high volume system, like I was mentioning for some of the vegetable crops, you could run it during gotcha. the freeze, right? But if you don't have the high volume system or a micro sprinkler, and I've never tried, I don't know, I don't, you know, I imagine there's somebody that has, but I'm not saying anybody use micro sprinklers to try to protect their vegetable crops. Um, you know, the other thing too is remember, you know, vegetable crops are quite herbaceous. Um, so in general, they tolerate less, you know, 32 and many of them are, you know, pretty much history, but I'd, I'd have to look into that. I don't, I don't deal with vegetable crops that much. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Anyway. Um, so, it, you know, I, I keep harping on this uh, post seminar evaluation. If you have a chance, if you can click on that and fill it out, it's, it's basically just checking off. Uh, I do ask you what crops you're growing, but other than that, it's pretty much yes, no, loved it or hated it um, type of thing. So if nobody else